Hey guys, I'm Rachel Cruz. I'm George Camel. And this is Smart, Smart Money, Money Happy, Happy Hour. Hour. Cheers. It's a beautiful drink. Wow. Wow. Fantastic. Mocktail of the year. You'll have to wait and see. Fantastic. Uh, well, this is the show where two friends who happen to be money experts talk about what you're talking about. Everything from pop culture, current events, and money. And today, we're talking about scams that have stood the test of time. Scammers. They're don't, out there. Don't like them. Don't need them. They've been there a while. And we're going to break it all down for you. But there's nothing new under the sun, Rachel. All these scammers are just stealing like an artist from their ancient counterparts. It's all been done. That's yep. why we call them scam artists. That's why we Get call them no. I'll be here all week. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> but hey, before we mm. fire up the old time machine, Rachel. This is fantastic. What are we sipping on today? It's like a holiday in a glass. It's an apple butter mocktail. It's delicious. A little cinnamon, a little sugar, a little apple. I don't know who could not like this. Like, you must hate Santa Claus <laughs> if you don't like this drink. So, yeah. Honestly, for all of you that love the mocktails... This and even is the if one. you love a cocktail, I'm going to say, do it. Do it for the kids. It's delish. That's, the kids can actually drink this. So yep. that's a good point, Rachel. Thank yes. you for that. We're going to give you our rating, reveal the cost per glass, and give you the secret recipe at the end of the episode. So stick around. That's right. Okay, so let's start with one of the first ever recorded financial fraud situations. Are you ready for this? And let's get props to the team. Yes. Okay, Haley, did some digging into the history Impressive. books. Impressive. Opened up the encyclopedias, really did the research on this one. And Went this to the story, local libraries. This, is, this story is going to knock your socks off. It involves a Greek merchant. <laughs> you ready for this one, Rachel? It's, it's crazy. Go. Okay. Here we go. You got to track with me, people. So if you're like, you stay know, with, stay if on you're the doing toes. the dishes or going on a bike ride or whatever, focus. Stay with me. A Greek merchant named Hegestratos tried to pull this off in 300 A.D., Year of our Lord. Tracking? <laughs> I, didn't Jesus die like at 30, 80? <laughs> I never said anything about his death. It's just the year of our Lord. It's a statement. Oh, I thought it was like the year of Jesus. It's just a thing people <laughs> say. 2023, like, year of our Lord. Oh, I just thought our Lord. I just heard people say died, it. I, I don't know what it means. 33, right? At 33? No. <laughs> Thank okay, you for already going. throwing my story off. Okay, go, go. So this Greek merchant named Hegestratos... 300 AD, merchants are delivering goods by cargo ship at this time, right? You can of picture course. it? Of course, yeah. Like so, they, like like um like Pocahontas. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Just give up. Just stop John where you Smith. are. John Smith. <laughs> Just backpedal the right sales. out of there. Well, the, the ship probably had big sails. Like Sure. So it could have sails. It. I'm trying to help people picture it. Go. <laughs> Story time with Rachel is going great. All right. So there's an insurance system that was developed called Bottomry where a merchant would use their ship as collateral to get a loan. You tracking? Yes. So that means if they don't pay, the ship, the is, ship not, is out. The ship is out. People will do this like on their homes today. Like, yeah. I'm going to take out a lien this against my home. You know. Yeah. So that loan would then finance the voyage to deliver a merchant's goods. Yep. Once the cargo was delivered, the merchant would take part of the profit and pay back the loan with interest. Mm -hmm. That's the goal. But if the ship sank on the way to make the delivery, the merchant didn't have, the, didn't have to pay the loan back. So the lender wow. lost their investment. Okay. So this guy, Hegestratos, this Greek genius, he had some corn that needed to be delivered, took out one of these loans to finance the voyage, but then he had an idea. Maybe he could sell the corn somewhere nearby for a profit, sink his empty ship, <gasps> no corn on there, and pocket mm. the loan money. Wow, it's pretty smart. So it was like the first instance of insurance fraud, but <laughs> the crew caught him in the act of trying to sink the ship, and Hegestratos drowned trying to escape. Oh, no. Lost his was life. Was it smart? Was it stupid? Well, if he didn't die, I could see how, like, it's not traceable, right? Like, if you're, like, an immoral person and you're going to be a scammer, that would be the day you'd so be a scammer. So that's Rachel's boundary for a crime. If you <laughs> die, <laughs> dumb. If you succeed, <laughs> genius. You're a freaking genius. No. I'm just saying it's creative. It's for not moral. 300 AD, like, he couldn't Google, like, insurance yeah, fraud Yeah, he had to make that up on his own, in his own cargo. head, and think, like, okay. But, man, you'd have to sink a ship. How How does one man sink a ship? It's not like there's an iceberg or something. Like, the old— I assume there's, like, a plug. He can just, like— No. Take the... <laughs> they how weren't would super fancy. It? How would you— Okay, think about it, George. How would you sink a ship in 30, 300 AD? Go. Um, I would find out where the openings of the ship are. Okay. And then I'd— make that opening bigger so that the water comes through and then the ship starts to sink. 
I assume that's how it works. I would run it into a cliff. You can't. Where is there a cliff? What if you're in the I'd middle of the ocean? Run into a mountain, like into the shore, and let it. So like, in your scenario, there's an ocean, and then there's a mountain <laughs> touching that ocean that you can just run into. Uh, I with would no find shore, a, you just I, hit mountain immediately. Well, you hit the shore. I mean, there's like cliff. I mean, there's yeah, there is places that a cliff it goes straight down. <laughs> That makes so much sense to me. It's How like is a this wall a mock tail? Are we sure this is a mock tail? And you go straight in and okay. crash it. So that's what and you, you would have done differently. you got to do it not near a town, right? Sure. <laughs> okay, how about this as a scam with a boat? <laughs> boat scams? What if you went and like hid your boat somewhere and said it sank? Where do you hide a boat? Well, I don't know in another, my island that I'm talking about right now. What if okay. you went and, seriously, what if he could have hid the boat, came back and said, it sank, got the money, and then he had a boat and money, and then moved to like a different town. You're right. That is smarter. That's better. If you're oh, going to commit the I crime. I should have been there for him. You should have. 300 AD. <laughs> I should have. You were just. Just a. 1,700 years <laughs> too late, Rachel. Anyway, so sorry. Okay. So the modern day equivalent to that, obviously, is when it comes to uh, insurance fraud. So are you ready for this? Hit me. Uh, this was one a sinking your Bugatti for insurance. Okay, tell me more. Is it Bugatti or Bugatti? I say Bugatti. 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 Okay, and two. Okay, ready for this? Two thousand nine, the year of our Lord, Andy House purchased an extremely rare one million dollar Bugatti Veyron. Veyron, and drove it into a swamp, hoping to collect a whopping two point two million dollars for the insurance payout. Are you ready for this? <laughs> he claimed he swerved off the road after getting distracted by a low-flying pelican. We've all been there. The old low-flying pelican routine. <laughs> okay, here's the worst part. Are you ready for this? Okay. A passenger in another car was admiring the Bugatti in the lane over and was recording it. He ended up catching the entire accident on camera and there was no pelican. Unbelievable. Wow. What happened next, Rachel? Um... Uh, he pleaded guilty to in insurance fraud and was sentenced to a year in prison. A year? Okay, the, that, yeah, that's so wrong. For Can't do that. For illegally trying to get $2 million, if you went and robbed a bank for $2 million, you're going away for much longer than that. This guy essentially oh, did that. that's a good point. You know, without the the whole stick up. Yeah, Pelicans, man. Golly, what you. an idiot. They'll get you. But hey, he had the money to buy a million dollar Bugatti, so maybe I'm the idiot. Yeah, I don't know why he's... Probably probably took out a car loan, let's be honest. Yeah. Well, let's talk about this, Rachel, because there's some lessons learned here. Obviously, no one out there is doing things at this scale. No one's got their cargo ship with corn trying to pull off this fraud. No. But insurance fraud still happens today. Yes. Oh, yeah. So exaggerating an injury or damage in a car accident to get a bigger payout. Ooh. Lying about an online order, never arriving and receiving a refund. Complaining about service at a restaurant to get the meal comped. So... So just kind of the little there's white like lies. Little, there's some of those like On frauds. top of the major ones. Like mm -hmm. if you lie on life insurance. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Insurance fraud's a big deal. That's, that's big time. Yep, yep. Do not do that. Don't do that. Nope. Um, and fraudulent claims cost the insurance companies money, and they recoup those losses through higher premiums and rates for everyone. So you're basically screwing us all over <laughs> with your insurance fraud. Don't Had do that. Had And it all started with you. That corn and that ship. I mean, God bless the Greeks, but really. Man, unbelievable. Okay, what's ben another Murph. What's another old scam, George? Here's another one. Selling the Brooklyn Bridge. Mm. So if you ever heard this quote, if you believe that, I've got a bridge in Brooklyn to sell you. Nope. You've never heard that. <laughs> I don't think so. Where have you been? On a ship, trying to sink it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're sinking this episode right now. Here's where this phrase comes from, Rachel, that you just found out about. Okay. It was pulled off in the 1880s by a guy named George C. Parker. Hey, George. No relation. <laughs> My last name's not Parker. So he repeatedly tricked people, usually tourists and immigrants, into buying, quote unquote, the Brooklyn Bridge. What does that even mean? Well, he so he would use forged documents to convince people that he was the owner of the bridge and he was looking to sell it. Oh, so he'd be like, hey, yeah. I own this bridge. You interested in buying it? And I'm sure they were like, eh. And then part of his sales pitch was claiming that a buyer could make a fortune if they just put a toll system on this bridge. 
Uh, Money-making scheme. So the police actually had to run off a few of the victims when they tried to set up barricades and charge for bridge access oh, no. to a bridge that they did not, in fact, own. But they thought they did. They like, Did they think they or- owned, like, a percentage of it then? Well, here's the thing. He would sell this bridge twice a week from anywhere to seventy five to $50,000, depending on the gullibility of the buyer. Oh, my gosh. That's wild. And $50,000 in the 1880s, that would be like a million dollars today, I feel like. How do people just have that walking around? I know. That's crazy. That's some tourist uh, money right there. So, Would you ha- fall for this? Uh, no, it feels... The fact that you hesitated worried me. <laughs> <laughs> you were like, mm, nah. And I was trying to put myself like by the Brooklyn Bridge, and like a man comes over, and he's like, would you like to buy the Brooklyn Bridge? I'd be like, that sounds I got too odd. much stranger danger to be Yeah, even, that feels off. I don't do solicitations. It's the like, too good to be true feeling, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, so now I'm going to say Also, no. what am I going to do with the bridge? I don't know anything about bridges. I know, and then he, like, convinces them that they can, like, do a toll. Yeah, that's sad. No good. So there's kind of the modern-day equivalent to that, George. Okay. It's called Selling the Invisible Airport. Are you ready Ooh. for this? Emmanuel Wude, a Nigerian businessman with history and banking, sold a fake airport to a Brazilian bank. Are you ready for this? For 242 million dollars. Whoa. This guy, Emmanuel, posed as an influential Nigerian banker and convinced the director of Banco Noroeste Noroeste. 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 to invest $242 million in the new airport there in Nigeria. So the bank made a series of payments between 1995 and 1998 for the airport that didn't exist. Wow. Emmanuel was sentenced to 25 years in prison, and he fleeced the bank so badly that it collapsed in 2001. Oh, that's sad. Okay, so he convinces a bank. That there's a real airport. I don't know why this bank decided to invest in this airport in Nigeria that they've never seen. Yeah. That feels first- like problem number one here. Mm-hmm. And this was not like the 1800s. I mean, this is the 90s. Yeah, for sure. So I think whenever there's any type of deal that you're making in life. How did this guy go? Oh, I guess they didn't have emails back then. Anytime I see, you know, Nigerian prince, I go, this can't be right. This can't be it. I know. Something totally. tells know. me this is off. Yeah. So if you find yourself wanting to buy an airport or just or a, bridge. a bigger, you know, purchase, go slow. Do your due diligence. Talk to a lawyer. Talk to, like, get references. Like, Go see the thing you're buying, for starters. (laughs) Don't buy sight unseen. I know, yes. But this happens with smaller things. Luxury goods on the internet. Someone selling those sneakers, that purse, for a too-good-to-be-true low price. Yes. They're in a tight spot financially. There's usually, like, a sob story, and there's always urgency. Yes. That's always my red flag. Or it's if like, there's like des- if I can smell the desperation, I'm like, uh-uh. Scam. No, thank you. Doesn't feel right. Red Doesn't flag. feel right. Man, old airport. All right, you ready for this one? Yeah, I'm ready. Bernie Madoff, the OG uh, Ponzi schemer. There he is. The fraudacity, Rachel. The fraudacity. The admitted mastermind behind the largest known Ponzi scheme in history worth $64.8 billion. So, I mean, the guy got a scheme named after him. I mean, so you got to hand it to him. He made the Hall of Fame. $64.8 billion. That's that is insane. so much money. We did an episode on billionaires. That, there, the that's one way to do it. Been all, yeah, it would have been on there. So, of course, it's named after the Italian swindler, Charles Ponzi. Mm. He pays early investors with money taken from new investors rather than actually investing funds in the market. So that's how the Ponzi scheme works. It's just sort of feeding itself, but you need more suckers to get into it in order to keep it going. And how does it all unravel eventually that the money like ends up running out basically and you're just like – If you don't have enough suckers to keep them in, then you have to pay those people out and the money runs out. I mean billions of dollars. Like this isn't just like some like thing on the side. That's crazy. So one of the first known instances of this was carried out by a woman named Sarah Howe in the 1870s who operated Ladies Deposit Company of Boston. Hmm. Bernie, almost exactly 100 years later, Madoff began following in her footsteps and he was chairman of the NASDAQ in the early 90s was arrested on December 11, 2008 for ripping off thousands of investors over the course of nearly 40 years. Oh, my god! How did he live with himself doing this for decades? That's so crazy. So Madoff said that he began the Ponzi scheme in the early 1990s, but an ex-trader admitted in court to faking records for Madoff since the early 70s. Oh, he had, like, inside people working for him. I guess you'd have to at that scale. Oh, man. Unbelievable. Well, this one reminds me. I mean, obviously, MLMs, we've talked about it on the show. <laughs> 
But the gullibility of people to get into it going like, well, hey, if you just pay this, you're going to make this. And yeah, so the it, promises and there's all some, that. There's some that lean pyramid scheme. There's yes. some that are just, they have products and you recruit sellers to sell a product and they're fine and legal. But there's some that lean yeah. gross kind of pyramid scheme. Yeah. Not Ponzi level, but a lot of them have been taken down. You know, I've heard of people, even in the last few years, um, that we even know, like even some of mom and dad's friends, who they invested money with somebody. And it's the same thing. It was a total scam. And they oh, lost it all. Oh, that's Because sad. the guy was like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, I can take this and we're going to do this. But like it was a total, maybe like kind of under the table deal maybe or yeah. something. Like, I don't know. Because I would assume you'd want to see like documentation. Maybe he had it all. But I've heard that a couple of times. So like even when you're investing your own money, making sure. You need oversight of it. Yes. And making sure you're with like a financial planner in a legit firm, like like making sure everything is is to a T. Yep. And it's not just some, some guy. Some weird under the table deal. Yes. Oh, that's, that's sad. That's really sad. So, so sad. So that can happen. So make sure to watch out. Make sure to watch out. Okay, before we jump into the next scam, we want to tell you about telestrations. Which is the like opposite of a scam. It's wonderful. It's wonderful and it's fun and it makes you happy and like scams. So this is one of my favorite games from Op Games and it's really simple and it's great when you have a group of friends hanging out. And the way it works is you have a phrase, you try to draw the phrase, the next person writes down what they think that drawing is. The next person draws what you wrote down that was, and it continues in this wild game of telephone until we're all just gut busting, showing, revealing our drawings, seeing what the actual phrase originally so was, and uh, it's a great game. Yeah, the best is when a pic the picture gets passed to you and you see a picture and you're like, I have no clue what this is. It's like a dog chasing a star. You know, you write yeah. the most random phrase. The first that... person has to be a decent, you know, doodler yes, in order yes. for this it's to work. It's funny. It's funny and it's great. So make sure to buy illustrations, make memories with your family. You can buy it at Walmart and start start playing some games, y'all. So fun. All right, let's uh, go to the next one. This is uh, Help Me, I'm Poor slash Unbelievably Rich. Which one is it? Unbelievably We're Rich. We're going to find this out. This is The Spanish Prisoner. Ooh, I haven't heard of this one. Ah, get ready. Let's dig in. Okay, so this scam actually has a lot of names. The Nigerian Prince. <laughs> I've heard of that one. Yep. The, quote, advance fee. But the structure of this game has been the same since the 1800s. Hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's what I always say when it comes to scams. So it always starts with a desperate stranger reaching out to you by letter or by email, you know, the modern day version. They claim they have legal right to a huge sum of money or property, but a government or other authority is withholding it from them. They claim they need financial help, lawyer fees, bailout money, etc., in order to secure the fortune that rightly belongs to them. So they ask you, Rachel to help them pay those upfront fees with the promise that when they get access to these funds, they will reward you handsomely. So People can, really fall for this stuff. All the time. Truly? Truly. Like that, no, less like, than I, they used to. Yeah, but I remember like when, when emails would be like you get the four words. Like when all that started coming out, I get that it was new and it was like, oh my gosh, I'm yep. like, maybe. But think about someone who's in dire straits and they really think, wow, I've been praying for a miracle. And they get this email and, this and they just, it, they're elderly. But it's not elderly. from a Nigerian prince. It would be from like a more. They can change the locations yeah. and the stories all the time. Sure, sure, sure. But if you contribute any money to their cause, here's what happens. They're like, I got the hooks in. They'll send follow-up letters requesting more money because there's complications. And they will do that until they bleed you dry or until you stop responding. And this became known as the Spanish prisoner scam in the U.S. during the Spanish-American War mm. in 1898. So during that time, here's what happened. A letter would be sent to prospective marks, a.k.a. suckers, in the U.S. from a soldier who was imprisoned in Spain. Oh, my gosh. The soldier would be like, hey, I need access to money or gold to pay out my way from the Spanish jail. And, of course, they promised to compensate them. Hey, once the war is over, you'll get your money back. Money would be sent, and some fake soldier on the other end got rich, profiting off of people wanting to support their troops. That's messed up. That is so sad. Whenever there's, like, a natural disaster or war, anything like that, oh, yeah. you were, like, preying on people in the worst time. Well, with the Ukraine stuff, there was a lot of scams. Yes, They're like, that's hey, right. give to Ukraine, and you didn't really know. People, I mean, honestly, George, I know we're not, like, the best of the best people, are you talking about me and you? Yeah. Oh, okay. But could you imagine? Sure. I don't understand. I don't know why you're throwing me under the bus. How do people do that? I'm not kidding. No, that's fair. How uh, do you, you have set to... up an account knowing that you're taking people's money and like claiming to bring this money to a country that is war ridden to help people and you're like keeping the money? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. 
I mean, you have no moral compass at that point. I, mean, I don't know what has and your I get that some like people get mad at like nonprofits because too much of the percentage goes to like administrate. You know what I mean? Like, like sure. that, that's like, a where's whole, the money really going? Yeah, that's the whole that. thing. But just a straight up scam. It's wild. That's messed up. Yeah. Well, there's the modern day version of these phishing emails. Yes. And I've fallen for a version of this. I'll be honest. And I bet there's one sitting in your spam folder right now, Rachel. Yeah. And I, a lot. I actually found one. You did. Yeah. Oh I'll gosh. just give you the, the high level Do it. of what it Do said. It. it landed. So if you search your spam, that's like Gmail's gotten better at this. So this is where these things end up. But this one uh, it involved God. Oh. I may not know you, but I believe if you were chosen by God to receive. Stop it. Yeah. Receive my donation of $2 million. You must be a God fearing man slash woman. Am Christian. And I believe that good things happen to those who wait and believe in faith and in truth. <laughs> It continues on. I will not go. But he said, I want to use this medium to congratulate you once again for being one of the lucky individual to benefit in this project, 2 million USD grant. Be assured you stand no risk as this is my money for source and verification. You can read more about me by viewing this. Link to YouTube video, which I will not click. Don't click that. It goes on and on and on. And uh, I did not respond, but I was tempted. Just to say I'm a God-fearing man. Yeah, just to see. Because what if this is the one time it was real? Oh, man. And it came right through that Gmail. And what if I gave him access to my checking and all of a sudden two milli shows up? You'd be out of here. I'd be out of here. You wouldn't be working. You'd be out, George. Oh, my gosh. Retirement. Yeah. Okay, that's pretty funny. And now scammers are using AI, Rachel, your worst enemy. Yes. Ow. Ow. To create these emails. And they yeah. make them sound like so legit. They've gotten real sophisticated. So legit. Okay, you ready for another another one? Hit me. Snake oil. Now oh. we've all heard this. 1890s. I don't know the etymology of snake oil. Okay, so uh, we owe this concept to a guy named Clark Stanley who capitalized on an interesting conjunction of all things in American conjunction, history. Conjunction, junction. Conjunction, junction. What's your function? Okay, so in the 1800s, thousands of Chinese workers arrived in the United States as indentured laborers to work on the Transcontinental Railroad. And okay. one thing they brought with them, snake oil, the legit kind. So it was made from Chinese water snakes, which is rich with omega-3 acids to help reduce inflammation. Oh, well, you like can get arthritis. that at Costco now. We Look don't need that. snake oil for snake that. Snake oil. They have omega-3s. Yeah, the I word got them. out. A lot of Americans allegedly wanted to get their own snake oil. At the same time, patent medicines were all the rage in the United States. So these were the cure-all uh, tonics that claimed to offer instant relief from whatever ailed you. Oh. Yeah. There was, you know, a tonic for everything. There was always something. So enter Clark Stanley, a very talented liar. So knowing that there was a market for snake oil, he developed Clark Stanley's snake oil. Okay. <laughs> Liniment. Liniment. Uh, he made it from rattlesnakes, which sounds so sketchy, claiming uh, he studied the art of medicinal rattlesnake usage with the Hopi, Ho Hopi, Indians? Hopi Indians. Okay. So then at that the— sounds legit. I'd believe him. At the, at the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago, he allegedly did a demonstration where he grabbed a live rattlesnake, gutted it, and plunged into boiling water— Skimmed the fat Ooh. as it rose to the top and bottled it on the spot. Mm. Gross. Took off in popularity. He claimed that it cured arthritis, inflammation, swelling from injuries, wounds, animal bites, scratches, and other pains. Wow. But here's the catch. Rattlesnake oil would be a scam in and of itself since it's far less effective than the original Chinese oh. water snake version. And then later on, he uh, turned out that Clark Stanley's oil— wasn't even made from rattlesnakes. So the government oh came in 1917, took it all. It was like a whole thing. But anyways, snake oil, that's it. That's wow. the whole like. But here's the thing. He was fined $20 for this whole ruse. And in today's in today's dollars, it would have been 429 That's nothing. I know. How is this guy not on the town square getting flogged? Covered in tar, where Rachel. Where is he? But snake oil, that's where it came from. But here's the thing. Originally, snake oil is real. Like. Yeah, the Chinese I did not know snakes. that. Me neither. Like when like he's selling snake oil. I'm like, well, if it's the good stuff. It's actually there. Yeah. It. So listen, you got you to do the if investigation. If it says Chinese water snake on the ingredients, you know you got the good stuff. You got the real thing. So the modern day equivalent of this, Rachel, to me, is a lot of these supplements. And a lot of them now form MLMs. They're multi-level marketing supplement companies, essential oils. And it's like, hey, this oil will cure everything. You'll get rid of COVID. I'm like, no, it's not. It. It, well, it smells nice. I'll it's give great. you that. 
I do think some stuff has like natural. There are some natural benefits. Yeah. But not yeah. to the extent they promise. Yeah. They promise a lot. That is true. I don't that buy is true. It. So that snake oil. That False snake advertising. Oil. If it sounds too good to be true, think critically, investigate. Mm-hmm. But okay. So we're all, we're all, we're not immune to any of this, Rachel. That's as right. much as we want to act like we would never fall for this. We're all gullible. Scams are scams. Okay, let's play a game and uh, drive this home. So okay. there's actually a new game with David Spade called Snake Oil, where contestants Ooh. hear outlandish pitches from two different products, and then they have to decide if it's a scam or if it's real. So, uh, Lindsay, I think you're going to give us a few. Yeah, we're going to play our own vi- version of this. Okay. And we're going to have to say game. what is no, real. Is like, so we're don't come at us, David Spade. Version, we're just having fun, man. Just for fun. All right. Um, so I'll describe two products. And you guys have to decide which one is real and which one is just fake. Okay. Okay? Ready. Here we go. I love games. We have— You're going to win. Which one is real? The gluten eraser, a tasteless power that neutralizes gluten from traditional flour products by breaking down this tough-to-digest protein— in advance. Just mix in one teaspoon of gluten eraser for every cup of flour and get back to enjoying your favorite foods gluten-free. Oh, George, are you That's feeling so, per- so personal? Okay. To Very you. personal. Next one. The migraine stick. A roll-on ointment that offers instant relief from migraines and tension headaches. Just apply directly onto your forehead, temples, or neck and let the cooling essential oil-based formula soak in and soothe the pain away. Which one's real? Which one's fake? I know which one it is, but you can go, Rachel, just so you can have a Migraine's at, I want real. You to have an at bat. Migraine's real. Gluten's fake. Agreed. You're correct. Ah. Yes. Good job. I had a great Next up, the rainbow yoga mat. Do you love a hot stone massage? This special yoga and meditation mat is filled with seven types of natural gemstones. I'm not going to name them all. <laughs> to give you a hot stone <laughs> surface for relaxation and meditation, just plug it in and let the far infrared rays bring the heat. Oh. Wow. That's Good one. marketing. All right. The clairvoyant caller. Is your pet hungry, stressed, excited? Stop the guessing game. Now you can now read your pet's mind in the new clairvoyant okay. caller. Thanks to tiny fMRI nodes and chat GPT like artificial intelligence, this special caller translates the simple electrical impulses of pets' brains into words using a special app on your smartphone. That's fake. Fake. I'm yoga going yoga real. Mat. Yoga mat's real? Yep. You're right. Yeah. There's Dang no it, way. I thought I was really going to stop I was like, now I will say the pet owner's – they that are crazy, like the crazy cat lady. I can see her buying that, being like, "I heard I love it. Jasper's right. thoughts. He's thinking of me." That's true. I got one more. Let's see if I can stump you. Okay. 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 The alarm dumbbell. Are you someone who is longing to be a morning workout person? <laughs> Me. Well, look no further. The alarm dumbbell is the product you need. To turn off this alarm, you'll need to do some workouts using the dumbbell, which will wake you up more and provide you with some extra exercise. I need Sounds that. like an effective alarm to me. Wow. Okay. okay. All right. Next one. Instant underwear. Ever been in a bind and needing a fresh pair of undies? We've got you covered. This pair of new 100% cotton underwear have been compacted into a small 2.5-inch disc. Just add water, and bam, you've got a fresh pair. Remember, it's better to have damp underpants than no underpants at all. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> wow. I bet the underwear is real. I'm going to go with the first one. You think the dumbbell's real? I have the dumbbell. And you think the underpants yeah. is real? I stumped one of you because the alarm dumbbell's not real. Dang it. Yes. <laughs> Rachel wins. See, so he would have been gold. It's because yeah. I want that product. It's the only way to get me to do any lifting. Is that pretty Sounds baller? Good. Because I have to turn off an alarm. I know. It's so like that an was escape fun. room, but for my body. But for your body. <laughs> that was a out. good time. There you go. That was fun. There's some crazy stuff coming out. Just don't get scammed, you guys. That's the moral of the story. That's it. All right, it's almost the end of the episode, and we close out every episode with guilty, guilty as, as charged. charged. And this is where our producer, Lindsay, gives us a new guilty as charged question every week. And if we are guilty, we have to take a sip. So, Lindsay, are you guys ready for this? Okay, sorry, I had to. Okay, what's the most used thing you've returned to a store? Oh, sorry, gosh. I got tripped up on my question. Do you know what I'm the most about? used thing you've returned to a store? Yes. Oh man, like to where it was almost embarrassing that yeah. you're even returning this. Yeah, like you waited a second. Like you used it for maybe 
Oh, uh, like there's too a, well, many days. I'll choose a bigger item just to not be that guy. Because I told the story about returning my vacuum to Costco. Yeah, I do okay. remember that. And a lady messaged me. She said, I heard this on Smart Money Happy Hour, and my vacuum hasn't been working great. And I was nervous gonna... to return it to Costco. And I was like, you don't need the... She was like, do I need the box? I was like, no, you need to have all the parts, but you don't need the box. And it worked. You and she was like, someone... they didn't ask any questions. They just returned it, and I got my money back. George, you're doing the Lord's work. Kirkland King. Well done. The bigger one is the mattress. What? I returned a mattress after 364 days. <gasps> Almost a full year? Because <sighs> yeah. they have a one-year tryout period. And oh you really God. came in hot at the end. George. Yeah. You just you didn't, didn't like, like it? it. Um, I think it was like, it was not soft enough for Whitney. She prefers a nice plush. Yep. It was a little firm. And I yep. gave it a year. I could have returned it earlier, but- Didn't care for it. Didn't care for it. I was hoping to make the best of it. And eventually I was like, well, the return period's about to end. So it's now or never, bucko. Funny. And they came wow. up and picked up the mattress. Wow. Wow. Free. Did you feel bad? No. <laughs> it's okay. No, these online mattress <laughs> companies, Rachel, they make good money. They're doing okay. It's not a mom and pop shop. You're they're, sticking it to someone. They're Silicon Valley faceless companies. Oh my gosh. They're fine. They're fine. It's their policy. They, no, if they don't, don't want to do know, it. I don't know, Linz. I don't know mine. Maybe like a shirt or something that I wore and I was like, I just don't like it. Do so you, you can't think of anything. You, like, you have just you keep ever it worn out of sight. twice before returning Say again. It? Have you ever worn an outfit twice before returning No. It? Not that I can think of. You have you return. ever returned anything? I'm not a good returner. Anyways. Oh, that's You should have returned your shrunken airport outfit. I should. <laughs> actually, I should have. Wait, is it out of like just laziness? Like, eh, not worth the trouble. A little bit. And that's what they're hoping for. Because a lot of my stuff, I don't, it's not expensive. So I'm like, what's so the for every for the 10 Rachels, there's one George who's like, I'm going to return the mattress. <laughs> Got to do it. Thank yeah, you for supporting me. I wish me. I had a good story. I don't think I, don't I do. One it's all right. George, hey, I'm well in trouble. Done. I cannot believe you slept on a mattress for a year and returned it. That is it. wild. I don't know if I like that. But, but he's within the time. So I didn't break any rules. It's their policy. Oh yeah, my gosh. You know, they offered to pick it up for free a year later. That is so fine. Okay. Uh George, you may have finished the drink first. It was that good. It was delicious. So it was we really had good. Christmas an in a cup. Apple butter mocktail today. And what is your rating? I mean, I would make that at home. So I'm gonna go. It, I mean, it will have a lot of ingredients. Like I just feel like it took some, it took effort. So I'm gonna go nine out of ten. Because you don't like effort. Yeah. We've yeah. made that very clear today. You don't like to be uncomfortable. <laughs> no, Read it's fine. Comfort crisis. Oh. Uh, I'm going 11 out of 10. Wow. Like in the mocktail world, and I'm going to shout out our uh, one of our producers, Skylar. Skylar Who just it. crushed this mocktail. She did. It, it is amazing. Her you should have seen Ibu. everything, though. It was, and Ibu. It was a joint effort. I mean, all of the ingredients. Like, it was a... They were out there whittling away at this yeah, apple. it was a feat. Whittling away. Here's what is in the apple butter mocktail... Apple butter. Bottom jeans. Apple butter jeans, boots, boots with the, the fur. fur. <laughs> That's the not whole, in here. Looking at her. The whole, she the whole the town was looking. Is it town? Yeah. Oh. Or the whole club. Ooh. Club? She only Hold knows on. Samantha Mumble. I said, I said, it's club, it's club. We got it. Stick to Samantha Mumble lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> Let me Love repeat. Sam. <laughs> Here's what's in this drink. Apple butter, apple juice, non-alcoholic orange bitters, Lemon juice, ginger beer, simple syrup, and cinnamon sugar for the rim. Wow. But you would think, wow, that's a pricey drink. What is it? And that's where you'd be wrong. Give me the break. One dollar and fifty five cents, no Bob. No way. No joke. No way. Oh, y'all. Think Budget about it. Apple juice is cheap. Delicious. Yeah. You know, a whole thing of orange bitters will last you years. Some lemon juice. Now ginger beer is probably is and, so and by the way, ginger beer is not alcoholic beer. It's just a more zingy, spicy. Yeah, ginger ale. It? Yeah. It's just more ginger it's very flavor. Very ginger-esque. And it's I, can a little taste, bit sweeter. I can taste that a lot in here. I can taste yeah. the ginger. So that's really the star of the show in here. And the cinnamon Beautiful. sugar rim really brings it to life. So good. So if you want the recipe, which I know you do, go check out the show notes. Make it at home. Let us know what you thought of it. Delicious. Wonderful. Well, George, great episode. You guys don't Wonderful. call for a scam. Don't do it. You're smarter than that. Just You're think listening of us. to smart money. Not Happy dumb hour. money, sad hour. No. <laughs> it's a different show. <laughs> That we should start. <laughs> You're smart. Don't fall for those scams. But yeah, I'm glad to know some of the history. You know, ships and snake oils. I learned a lot. Bugattis. Who knew? This is the kind of stuff you're not going to get from other podcasts. No, only here. Only here. And make sure to leave a review because we want to hear. Maybe if you fell for a scam, let us know. Ooh, you know? that's fun. We or leave know. it in the comments on YouTube, yeah. wherever. Subscribe because every Thursday we don't want you to miss a new episode of Smart, smart Money, Money Happy, Happy Hour. Hour.